keep in mind that the real money is in the second loaf. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology and action. So let's first do a follow-up. And this is our smoking report. I wish I could bring you one every week. I guess if I could, you might not see my fat ass again. This was CLOV. This is the recommendation uh, based on the hypothetical 100K account. Obviously, adjust up and down depending on your account size. And I'll give you the spreadsheet if you want, where you can just put your information in and it'll uh, calculate the initial profit target if you know your entry and your stop. Anyway, it was in a nice uptrend. We, it was also a Landry Light pullback. It was, it was a couple of things. It was an accelerating momentum strategy. Notice how it was kind of in a gradual uptrend. And then it really began to blast higher. And then again, a Landry Light pullback. Also, this little pivot point in here, that makes it a trend pivot pullback. Anyway, pulling back to the moving average completes the pattern for the Landry Light pullback. I was talking to one of you guys earlier today. I had put a bunch of moving averages on a chart and in Bollinger last week at Bandcamp, a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, I was talking about anchored Bollinger bands and just anchored moving averages and different things where you just pick a point on a chart and you start at that point. It's really good if you're doing some like intraday trading or something where you don't have enough data to give you a, a valid moving average. Anyway, it's something I've always wanted to do in IPOs and never got around to do it. I'm glad it kind of jogged my memory. I thought about programming something like if you had one day of data, a one day moving average, two day moving average until you get to your moving averages. But anyway, one thing I noticed, and, and it's not an original pattern, but the moving averages kind of squeeze down to the 30 EMA. And if you look at the Facebook group, I have a, a chart on that. And uh, different people have called it different things over time. But sometimes when you get those moving averages squeezing down, Landry Light pullback, same sort of type of pattern, same sort of type of analysis. But anyway, with these defined pullbacks, like a Landry Light pullback, they're great for scanning purposes. But the bottom line is you still need to learn how to pick the best. Years ago, my first introduction to somebody else's methodology, I thought if it fit the bill of step one, step two, step three, then it was automatically a setup. And he explained to me, no, it's, there's a lot more to it than that. So I think it's okay to scan for setups. And I think Landry Light pullback, so that squeeze thing I was just talking about or whatever, could be a valid thing to do. But number one, I think it's better to look at a lot of charts. And number two, your stock picking will get better if you do look at a lot of charts. And as I preach, I look it up, which is a couple thousand charts every day. Anyway, the entry was here, stop was down here, and the initial profit target was here. Now, like I said last week, we got into this position, and at one point we were up $400, and then at another point we were down $360. So it was quite a swing in equity, and that's on 100K. And then earlier today, when I take this snapshot, the entire position was up uh, 2060, oh, at the peak at least. Uh, I think it's made a higher high since then. But anyway, at the at the peak today, it was up $2,060. So lots of swings in there. Uh, this is an example of seeing each position to its fruition, which I'm going to talk about or beat to that horse again on in a few minutes. So not going what so far so good. Now, here's my actual trade. And when I first saw 299, when I was grabbing a screenshot, I'm like, well, hang on, Dave. Entry was three. Why'd you do that? So I did a little forensics, and I'll show you why I did that. And notice that the IPT was four. And I was watching it this morning, and this thing blasted higher over these two bars. Let me just back this out and show you. It blasted higher so fast that I was nervous that it wasn't going to get to four or beyond. So I was watching, and it went stalled out just a smidge. I went ahead and bailed out just a tiny bit early. And so I got a little bit less than that $1,000 that I want on the first loaf per 100K at least, but I had, I had enough, I had so many shares on of this, I have it in other accounts too, but I have so many shares, I was very happy to take sort of a gift horse because I didn't know whether or not it would make that initial profit target or not. And if you look at this trade, the time I made this trade, I also put a post in the Facebook to let everybody know that it was getting close enough. Anyway, so just to show that I wanted to make sure, make sure, sure that you know i didn't front run the setup by getting in at 299 when the entry was three i do remember now and after i looked at the chart looked at the time that i entered the setup triggered but then came immediately back in so i was watching on the trigger and i forget exactly how I probably had an alert at three 
and it hit the trigger and it came right back in. So I was like, okay, Dave, let me put a little discretion on this. And I went ahead and put in a re-trigger right around 290, well, at 299. In case it came back up, I would I would get triggered in on that. So that's why I got in a little early. I actually got in right here on this bar here, and I took a second entry. So I figured that if it was going to bust, it was going to bust through. It was going to make it to three again. It would bust through. So I went ahead and put an entry at 299. So just just an FYI, and that's why I did what I did. Uh, Linda Rasky was asking me. Was the first <laughs> Linda Rasky asked me a question. I was all excited. At, uh, it was kind of a pinch me moment once again at band camp at <laughs> the TSAASF. Uh, it's the San Francisco Technical Analysis Society. Great society, TSAASF.org, I believe. But anyway, so here's how I played it. I got a little bit less than that thousand dollars I wanted on the first loaf in this particular account, at least. This is my model account. I try to model out the trades here so I could show them and teach them. Good, bad, and indifferent, obviously. So. Keep in mind that the real money is in the second loaf, the second half of the trade. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully I'm in this stock for a long, 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 long time. Jeff was talking last week. He's been in, uh, I don't know if you're here or not tonight, Jeff, but when did we trigger into that ARLP? 2020 or something like that? I think it was 2019. It was long before COVID, if memory serves. And he's still in that position and he's done exceptionally well. We got stopped out. And go in and watch last week's uh, Dave Landers Week in Charts for a lot more on that. But anyway, that's where the real money is. I, and I did that preaching, I think, last week or week before about uh, longer term trends and, and how to make the, the real money in the markets. Now, when we hit the initial profit target, we move our stop to break even. And by the way, I'm going to mention this in a second, but I'm, I can go ahead and cover it now. Somebody was asking me a lot of questions about stops. I've been getting a lot of questions about stops lately and how to set them. And there's only two questions you need to ask yourself. If, if you're a member of DaveLander.com, there's a lot of stuff behind the firewall on stops. So go in and watch all of that. If you've been a member a while, you should have trading full circle. And the gentleman who asked me about stops, if he doesn't have it, let me know. And we'll see where you are and getting that. We'll get it to you. But the bottom line, you need to ask yourself, how far away does my stop need to be to ride out the normal volatility of the market? Now, this was an extremely high HV stock. Yeah, 117 is the HV now. And that's pretty crazy. That's um, SP 500. We'll look at it in a second. I think it's like 14 or 15 if it's that high. So you need to be outside of that normal noise. And I know about a 25% stop seemed kind of ridiculous on this one, but that's what it called for. That's the type of move that it makes. And if you're not outside that normal noise to ride out at least a short-term movement in the market, because we're looking to get that swing trade profit out, hopefully soon, then you're gonna get stopped out of noise alone. And the second question is, where would you be wrong? Without going into a lot of details, because we can pick this up again next week once I find all those questions. But where would you be wrong? Let's say this was a, a short, a transitional pattern. If it went on to make new highs, you would definitely be wrong there, okay? So that's the worst case scenario. So maybe try to improve upon it from there. Maybe you get a little bit fairly close to that high to give it enough wiggle room so it has time to roll over if it's gonna roll over. Same thing for buy, if you're buying a transitional pattern off the lows. If it goes to new lows, obviously you're wrong. It's no longer making a transition. It's going back to old lows. So those are kind of easy to kind of figure out, but the pullbacks is, how far do you give it if it keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back? So again, you want to be outside the normal noise of the market and you want to look at a spot where you would have failed. In this particular case, if it pulled all the way back to two, then that would look like a failure in the pullback. That also puts you all the way back to this prior breakout. So that's how I set the stop on that one. I tend to eyeball it and over time, you'll get better and better at this and you can just kind of eyeball them. But you always have to keep the market's risk and not your risk in mind. So, yeah, I only want to risk a few percent on each trade. But guess what? Risking a few percent, I'm going to get stopped out of noise alone. I, I did some S&G trading today, and I want to kick myself in the butt for doing it because it was stupid. And when I when you ever make a trade and you know you're making a stupid trade, when you make a stupid trade, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I write shame, and I made like a shame trade. I, I tried to get into a uh, a leverage ETF and use like a 10 cent stop on something that bounces around like crazy. And it was stupid and I didn't lose much, but it was just, it just felt like 
it just felt like I was just throwing money out the window because it, it all happened within about 10 minutes, you know? So it was stupid. Well, and I knew that I was within the normal noise. So make sure you're outside the normal noise. The only other thing that, that he was asking me about was something like HV. HV kind of gives you um, kind of a wake up call. So you're looking at something like this, is the HV in the triple digits. You know it's going to be super volatile, so you know you're going to need a really wide stop. And if you were statistically to set those stops based on historical volatility, I no longer, I no longer have the formula. I think for like telechart or anything like that, but I think the formula is buried somewhere in Metastock. But those stops based on historical volatility are extremely, extremely, extremely wide. So they're so far, they're so crazily wide that you couldn't, you you couldn't trade at those levels so that's the point i was making there so use it as a guideline but not a specific thing hopefully that made some sense and and i'll, I'll pick it up next week i didn't mean to get in all these details these are some of the details i was going to cover next week anyway uh we have a mystery chart this week this is a landry lights pullback you can see it was in a once again kind of a nice gradual trend okay and then it began to accelerate higher it has not touched its except for yesterday or today or uh, this happened today i think it has not touched the the 30 ema and 40 days thereabouts which is pretty impressive and then it pulled back to 30 ema and landry it goes back to zero so this is a decent looking setup it's a little wide and loose much longer term but it's really gotten its act together over the last several months and that's why i like it entry is here stop is there once again uber wide stop okay but if you look at the chart you know forget about the price action on the side you know get get rid of the scale on the side and that doesn't look like it's that far away i'm pointing to my screen like you've seen point the screen so that's what it calls for okay and you know setting stops really isn't rocket science what i would recommend you do is just two things one get better at stock picking that goes for me too it's like deliberate practice is what you need to do when you're looking at charts if you see a chart take off then look at the chart and say was there one of my patterns there should i have caught this setup and it's going to make you a better and better trade sometimes just for no reason whatsoever stocks go up okay you don't know what catalyst might have kicked in or what happened or who bought it or or who dumped it or whatever you know but look at a lot of charts and the other thing is i would err on the side of having them a little bit on the wide side especially if you're a little newer to trading but compensate by trading fewer shares it's just the opposite of what everybody tells you everybody tells you to use tight stops no use fairly loose stops okay but take your share size down especially if you're new to trading and i guarantee you oh, i can't guarantee i can't guarantee anything this business right i guarantee your chances of catching a winner will go up even if your stock selection isn't fantastic at this level at your level whatever but you will catch a few winners and then catching a few winners helps you to get the reps in and that's another thing that i want to get into too is is getting the reps in i've talked about it before and i want to revisit that quite a bit but anyway loosen your stops a little especially if you're getting stopped out a lot somebody told me a while back there was a couple of gentlemen one was like 20 or 19 the other was 21 they got stopped out 20 something times in a row 19 or 20 something stuff, whatever it was because it's more than one person this has happened kind of over and over again over the years and they're doing two things wrong their stops are too tight or their stock selection could use a little help okay now loosening your stops i have fixed so to speak a lot of people just by talking them into loosening their stops on positions. Anyway, I went way on a tangent. I didn't, I didn't sit on God on, but uh, I just want to let you know that I didn't forget about your question. All right, TFM 10% system. Let me just cover this real quick. These are 5%, within 5% is the green zone of the 50 week closing high, and that's where we are now. And you can see we made a 50 week closing high here and then here and then here and then here and then here that was last week this is a weekly chart so last week we made a 50 week closing high in the s p 500 so the top of the green zone which would be 100 percent of a 50 week closing high was hit last week that moves the green zone up 
the bottom of the green zone is 5% away from the 50-week closing high. And then the pink zone is more than 5% away. And then 10% is more than 10% away. So there's the rules right there. Just a drop below the pink, hot pink zone, which is 10%, and a 50-week simple moving average. Now, it's kind of interesting. I'm just noticing this in a live chart. We're getting really, really close to take it out that 10% level with the 50-week moving average. So if the 50-week, it's the greater of the 50-week moving average or the 10% line, okay? And or another way of looking at it, it has to close below both. But once the 50-week moving average gets above the 10% line, and that's just a little whipsaw filter, then the 10% line becomes the trigger. And we're getting fairly close to that. I asked the client for permission <laughs> to beat him up, and I was waiting for his answer. I'm going to do it anyway. You'll see that that'll make sense in one second. So the last cell was right here, close below the moving average and below the 10% line. And then the last buy, buys a little more stringent, two bars of Landry light and a close above the 10% line, okay? Anyway, so that's the cell would be below, below the 10% line and below the 50 week moving average, which again is catching up. Here's the NASDAQ trade I took the stop would be right now below the 50-week moving average, but that's catching up the price. And then after, once it does get above that 10% line, then again, 10% would be the sell on that. So the sell right now is like 437. You can see we made a 50-week high back here, but unlike the P's, we haven't made a new high. So the top of the zone remains flat. Anyway, so you can see it lost like 700 bucks since last week. And that's the thing with longer term trend following is if you watch the zigs and zags, it'll make you kind of crazy. And I'll just show you those in just one second. But anyway, this silly little position I thought was going to be like just for S and G's, ah, I buy 100 shares and I'll tell everybody, you know, I put on 100 shares based on the signal. Let's see what happens. And I I'm very happy it's worked out as it has, but it's like, wow, this thing went up 50%. Nobody would ever dream that you get in something like the Q's and be up 50% in what's that, a year or so, a year and change? Just a little over a year. But anyway, like I said last week, when you are in longer term trend following, and again, we do scale out as you just saw a few minutes ago. And I know I repeat myself a lot, but there's a lot of new people coming in and I get a lot of the same questions over and over. But if you're trading a pure trend following system like this one with no money management other than signals to get in and out, okay, then the drawdowns will be pretty abysmal. And that one was pretty painful, $8,000. And I think where it is now, it's right around $6,000 should that get hit. So that's the TFM 10% system. So far, so good. There's been many times where I wanted to bail on this, but I decided to just stick with it. And also, the great thing about this little simple system here is I've thought the market was pretty iffy, and, and it's still a little iffy here and there, as you'll see in one second quite a bit. And I never would have held on to a position uh, based on some of that iffy action with this longer term trend following. Now, individual positions, yeah, I just follow the plan. I know, all you got to do is follow the plan. Easier said than done. And we'll get to that in a second. But as far as like a longer term trend following system, I've forgotten how painful it was. I cut my teeth on these longer term systems many, many years ago. I did a lot of mechanical testing and trading. Anyway, last week I talked about this Osmo trade, and I just bought this when it broke out. And as I'll cover it just one second, I'm not a breakout trader, but in these shit coins, sometimes when they take off, that's HYT, you could just buy the breakout, buy the strongest ones, and I use a 20% initial profit target. Now, as I discussed last week, I mined off, so to speak, $25 of Bitcoin, not to rehash too much or beat the dead horse i looked into actual mining because i'm a nerd and i like that kind of stuff and uh, i realized very quickly that at least with our cost of power which is much lower than the rest of the nation shockingly it's much higher than it used to be when i lived in the country but anyway uh the cost of power it would not be prohibitive you could buy a used one on ebay uh and maybe even a new one for a few hundred dollars and you plug it in, it would lose about 10 bucks a day, <laughs> just burning electricity for, for no purpose. So anyway, so I came up with the brilliant idea of as I make money in these shit coins, 
mine off a little bit while they're going higher into Bitcoin, just like $25 here and there for shits and giggles. And to my surprise, it's actually added up a little bit. Now, take a look at this trade, which is a great example of why that tiny bit of scaling out works. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't scale out more than half, okay, uh, or half and half again. For instance, you take off half of this initial profit target, and I just use 20% in these shit coins to keep the math easy. Eventually, I will probably have to adjust more for volatility. But anyway, I wouldn't take off like another half or anything like that, but just take off a few bucks here and there when this thing is, is blasting higher. So it was down at 48 cents and it ran to almost 70 cents. That's a pretty impressive run, 40 something percent run over a short period of time, a few days. So I feel like it's worth doing this and now I'll have the Bitcoin forever. Not that I want to buy and hold, but with just little nickel and dime stuff, it doesn't really matter. Now, whenever this this little mining experiment gets up to something substantial, then yeah, I'll probably need to do some some money management on that. But it's just a fun thing to do. Now, truth be told, and this could be one of the million little things, this this one actually dropped a little further than I planned. And I thought I was stopped out, but I found out that I wasn't. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if I had an order in place or something. And uh, for some reason, it, it, it kept on. Uh, I ended up with more of this than I thought I had. But I did get out, and I think that's a sell right there. So um, kind of a scratch uh, on the, or not much more than a, than a scratch on the second loaf on that. But better than the poke in the eye. Now, just real quick, the Landry 100, this is just a proof of concept. I'm just buying new highs, so to speak. Everything I've showed you so far, the clove trade, the shitcoin trade, and uh, you know, not never say never, but I will never show you anything that I haven't already actually done. And in, in most cases, I, I have showed the setup ahead of time. For instance, that mystery chart I showed, if that triggers tomorrow or the next day or whenever, I will follow up on that position in upcoming shows. And that's actually in my trading services a setup for tomorrow, davelander.com slash trading service. If you want to see the archives, davelander.com slash archives. You can see the archives, warts and all, including that clove trade soon. I'll update them first chance I get. Now, this is more of an experiment, more of a proof of concept. And I ran this years ago, ran it, so to speak. And it did exceptionally well, although it did get whacked every now and then. And I stopped doing it for various reasons because it was work. But then I, I'm, I'm sorry that I did because it's a really good experiment and it does get you looking at this, the momentum in the markets. And you'll, you can actually see the ebb and flow of the sector action coming and going within, within the list. And that's kind of a cool thing too. I know you want to party with me. But all of these were bought at new highs. And I don't know how hard that is to read, but that's, 93%, 50%, these are all 40s and 30s. And this was all started, uh, I think, on May 30th. I rebooted this. And you could see that some of the dates in here, and this one was entered on at the end of July, and it's up 100% or thereabouts since. Now, there's no money management in this. I just take them out as they lose momentum or if they go negative for a while. And the other thing I do is I let new... Like I wasn't going to make any changes in tonight's list, but when I looked at my new highs list, I found four of them that I really liked. So I added those four in. And if you're in uh, Facebook, I could publish a list there and uh, maybe tweet it out too. Anyway, so that's just sort of, a, a again, a proof of concept. And if we get into, God forbid, a choppy, choppy market or worse, a bear market, then Cash, I treat cash as an asset class in this list. So I'll start, the, there'll be slots for cash and then the rest will be any stocks. And I might, I won't do inverse ETFs for, because there's a bad decay problem with those. We can get into that at some point in time. I talked about it in the past, but they all go to zero eventually. For instance, SQQQ was, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it was over $500,000 a share when it when it came public.